Happy Monday, everyone. Today is December 18th, and this is episode 34 of Get Your Tech Gone, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of Nimble This and the Volpe Firm. This is a true geek channel. With us is John Downey, the man of many thoughts and even more questions. John is also CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. John, so glad you can be with us today. Always a pleasure. Random thoughts. <laughs> also <laughs> with us is Ron Rannick, meteor hunter and professional laser aficionado. In his spare time, he also works with Cisco Systems and is technical leader of engineering. Ron, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Hey, Brady, thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you, Ron. And lastly with us is Dick Shimp, a man who likes to smoke stuff. What, <laughs> what that is, I'll let him explain. And he also supported the Library of Congress via music. Dick is also ComSonic's Chief of Technology. Dick, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Brady. So today's topic is how p &M further enhances troubleshooting of uh, troubleshooting in the new age of test equipment in broadband cable. So we're going to have a roundtable, talk about proactive network maintenance, or PNM, and also test equipment and how they are really both go hand in hand in the cable industry today. To start off, I'm going to share um, just a couple pages of a presentation uh, where uh, Dick Shimp and I worked over the summer uh, to do a field trial working with some leakage equipment and also a uh, uh, PNM. Uh, first of all, we started off with PNM to find a bunch of modems in the system that were having impairments. And then we went out to individual subscribers' homes. We found those impairments. And so actually, this, this is the um, white paper. You can download, download this white paper from uh, the NimbleVis website and it's also hosted on broadband libraries website under their white papers section as well as on the comsonics uh, website so lots of places to get this white paper where you can download it again the the main topic of this white paper was we we used um first p m to identify a number of homes where there was problems and once we went to those problems, we used this, um, some Comsonics gear, some leakage equipment gear. And I, I was wondering, Dick, maybe you can just, um, for the audience, briefly explain what the concept of this home pressure equipment does and what it does inside the home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the signal levels in the home are fairly low as they, as they arrive. And it kind of puts a, a, a real stress on normal signal leakage gear to pick it up. Um, with enough, uh, providing enough information that you understand what kind of shielding integrity you might have inside the home. Having a good bit of shielding integrity is very, very important, I think, in the home. There's a lot of stuff in the house that, that can create junk that just boggle everybody's mind in the upstream bath. So what we do, or what the pressure testing does, is disconnect the system at the, at the ground block and uh, insert a high level, in our case, a, a custom signal so that we know that we're looking at just us, nobody else. Uh, and given that high level injected into the uh, entire wiring within the home, gives the opportunity for tiny little fissures that might occur, uh, loose connectors, uh, a myriad of things, staples through the cable, all sorts of things that you might can cover. Um, it gives it an opportunity to improve the dynamic range of the leakage testing gear, uh, therefore making those small, not necessarily, um, well, they're just, they're just not good for the system. So, so, but, but it gives us an opportunity to improve the dynamic range and pick all the little stuff up and just fix your internal plan. Let me, let me ask a question. What about frequency selective issues? Are you injecting a broadband range of frequencies or individual frequency? You know, what if a crack in a cable only leaks at 700 megahertz, but it doesn't leak at 27 megahertz or vice versa? Yeah, the, the, our pressure tester 
has the three frequencies that it stands between. It'll pick a low frequency, one down in the FAA band to make sure that you're, you're kind of clean there. We inject one at 612 megahertz and one at 774, 774 megahertz. So it's just about in the, in the LTE band, just below the LTE band and in the FAA band. And it cycles between the three, just continuously cycles until you lock it down. But it will continuously cycle, as will the receiver continuously cycle. So it's looking for those three frequencies and only those three frequencies as encoded by our device, by the uh, pressure test. Hey, Dick, you mentioned that the, these test signals are injected at a high level. Just how high a level? Two selections are available, Ron. We're, we're looking at... Um, uh, plus 40 dBmV and plus 60 dBmV. In extreme cases, uh, plus 40 might even be hot, and you can always pat it down. It's harder to get the signal up than it is to push it down. So uh, those two levels are available, uh, selectable by the user. Okay, thanks. So, I, so that's uh, so that's what's meant by pressurizing the drop. You're you're uh, injecting a very very high level test signal into the into the drop network to enable the identification of what would otherwise be really, really low level leaks that couldn't be detected with a typical leak detector, um, given the low, the normally low levels in the, the downstream direction in the drop. Exactly, exactly true. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna talk just, just briefly, because I think that's a really good point, Ron, why, why pressurizing that drop is so important. Um, p and tools will identify subscribers' homes that have really bad problems, like what I'm showing on the screen right here. This is showing an individual subscriber's home that has two what we would consider impaired upstreams. We're not seeing it, or I'm not seeing it, Brady. No, I'm still seeing the text of the text of the uh, report. Ah, uh, you are. Yeah. Uh, let me let me just uh, stop sharing that and uh, reshare it again because uh, for some reason it's not keeping up with what I'm showing. I think. Oh, I think I'm sharing maybe the wrong thing. There. Um, are you seeing the uh, in-channel frequency response now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so so we see two um, two upstreams that are having really bad in-channel frequency response. This is what the PNM tool says, and and because uh, we see the digital pre-equalizer taps that we get from the cable modems, and then most of the times we know that when uh, taps nine and ten are elevated, these are the taps just to the right of the main tap. This is a pretty good indication that this is an in-home problem. So a lot of times if we don't go to the subscriber's home with any type of tool, it's going to be looking for where the problem could be. And many technicians start by replacing the drop, then they'll rescan the modem, they'll replace the, some ground blocks. You, you kind of get into a blindly replacing equipment or blindly replacing cables, connectors, um, lots of different things that are in the subscriber's home. And that can be a tedious effort. It can be expensive effort if you're replacing things that don't need to be replaced. Once you eventually fix the problem, then um, in, in this particular case, we found that uh, it was an, an in a, a splice done on the drop. The splice had become leaky and the connectors were corroded. They were actually um, twist on connectors. Uh, so there was some water in there. We replaced those. We actually replaced the whole drop. And now when we rescan the modem, we see that instead of having that poor in-channel frequency response, this modem now has really nice flat in, in frequency channel response. That's the goal. That's taking a modem that's performing poorly and converting it into a modem that's performing really well. We now don't have any leaks going into the return path, so we're not leaking ingress. Now back to what Brady question on that you the uh, the previous graph before the repair showed the really poor in channel yeah. frequency response and then you indicated in the photos the the uh, the bad connector how did you identify the specific location of the bad connector in the drop so that's the in on this particular case we were working with um, Dick and the team from Comsonics and they used the the pressurized the home pressure test kit and it immediately started alarming near the leak so maybe dick you can explain how that worked yeah we, we disconnected it at the at the top and uh connected the the high the high level transmitter the, the uh, our mini mobile marker uh 
we call it 3M for short. Um, injected, and, and as soon as we plugged it in, uh, the, the, the compass leakage detector just started squawking like mad. Uh, and it, he didn't, the, the, the tech didn't have to go very far down the drop until he found that splice. It would just look, you know, like a mouse in a, in a tube. Uh, but following it all the, all the the whole length of the drop, you could follow the, the path, uh, and, and it kept pushing us right back to, you know, Ron, you're you're very familiar with this. You, you can you get standing waves on the line, and you, you get all kinds of readings when you get some skill to <laughs> signal leakage detection. But but, but eventually, um, uh, the, the maximum signal was located at that that uh, splice location. So, okay. yes. What, what I find what I find in, in, interesting is we all know the standing wave and the distance to the problem is inversely proportional. So if there's an in-channel standing wave, and that channel is only, say, 6.4 megahertz wide, to get a full symbol or cycle of a standing wave, that would almost indicate 200, 300 feet, I think, if you do the math. Ron, um, if, if it's a 6.4 megahertz wide channel and you get what's called a, a 1T echo, where that first tap after the main tap is elevated, with a 6.4 megahertz wide channel, that equates to about 85 feet distance. Okay. That, okay. and, and that would be a, the length of an echo tunnel rather than necessarily yeah. the distance yeah. from yeah. the motor. So it was probably from the tap to the splice, probably like 85 feet long. Oh, right. Yeah. And that's that's a big challenge when you're troubleshooting in, in in-home or near-home impairment is most of your echo cavities are in the 85-foot range if you have a 6.4 megahertz upstream or could be 170 foot if you have a 3.2 megahertz upstream. When you're dealing in 85 foot or 170 70 foot echo cavities in, in a drop or near home, you're pretty much talking about the whole drop or the whole subscriber's home. That's, that's why using test equipment such as the, the pressure testing equipment is so beneficial because now I don't say, well, I just have to blindly replace the drop or blindly replace ground blocks and in-home wiring. I can use a pressure test kit to go out and zero in on exactly where the, the impairment is and then just fix a single impairment. Or maybe we find two bad connectors or something like that and fix just the impairment, just not replacing things. So that, that, was, that was the really excited, exciting part in, in doing this, this trial that we did, this testing over the summer. I mean, even if you do the echo... Uh, calculations and you figure out the footage, you don't know what the other impedance mismatch is causing the echo, meaning the cavity. So you could estimate from the tap out, or you might say, well, it's from the home, the other direction. I still don't know, but I understand what you're saying is by injecting a signal, you just look for the leakage and you could cross-reference that with your footage and say, this is most likely the cause. But you're going to fix it regardless anyway. And when you fix it and then you redo your test, it's all clean. You're like, all right, I found it. But you might fix it, that leakage, but the original problem is still there, right? It could have been a different echo cavity. Yeah, and we did actually encounter that where we would fix the leakage aspect of the test. We would connect everything back together, and then we would find out there's a bad inline filter. The filter itself wasn't leaking any RF signal, but there was maybe a con compound problem. We had... We had some compromised shielding. We fixed that. Then we found, ah, there's a filter that was in there that was also bad. So it helps yeah. you find those complex compound problems. Can you show that, that bad cable again, the, uh, the bad splice? Sure. Well, I have a, a serious question for you on that one. I assume like you had to cut away the shrink wrap or, or whatever it was, tape. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so... So and the this serious was, question is, how did you get someone's feet so small? <laughs> I'm looking at that picture. I'm like, why does the drop cable look like it's five times bigger than a person? Well, it, it it's being held up in the air here, close to uh, close to a camera, and the the feet are down on the ground. <laughs> Come on, it was a I little get, person. You know I could zoom it in there. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Those little feet. And the focus well, was still bad. Ron, what is that? Uh, three meter foot cable? <laughs> <laughs>
Now you're just being ridiculous. Come on now. <laughs> and it's only Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, that was, um, that's using home pressure testing. And I think we did about 15 homes and on every single home, it was a hundred percent successful in really reducing the time that you would normally spend ident looking for where the problem is because it takes you immediately to the problem. There was another one where we used the home pressure testing and it was able to find an underground buried cable because the, the leak from the underground where there was an underground splice was leaking um, with enough emissions that uh, you could you could really walk along where the cable was buried underground, the drop cable, and the signal was longest where the, where the uh, splice was underneath. The sig signal was loudest where the splice was underneath. So I, I was also impressed that you could use it to basically trace a buried cable and also find where the splice was and where it was leaking underground. When you guys um, got ready to do the tests in the system, um, I assume that you identified the homes uh, to visit in advance because of what was found with the PNM tool rather than just making some arbitrary selections of drops to see what you might find. Yeah, so we actually identified 50 homes uh, about one month in advance of the test. And of those 50 homes, the operator was able to schedule appointments with 25 of the homes so that the, the homeowner was available uh, because in, in some of the cases, we actually had to go into the subscriber's home and do troubleshooting of the in-home wiring where mm -hmm. the, in some cases a subscriber had bad splitters or reverse splitters or bad wiring going in different directions. So you do need to get access to the home in those scenarios. But the PNM tool helped you identify which homes still had the problems. Yeah, yeah, we knew which homes had problems. It's okay. now a matter of when you get to those homes, finding out where the bad, pro where the bad wiring is, where the corroded wiring is. Uh, we found, for example, one um, ground block that... Uh, uh, Dick, do you remember what the issue was? It was a it was an a, a, a ground block that was a surge protecting ground block, if I recall. Right. But yeah. that that ground block was actually the 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 problem because it was emitting noise. Connectors were fine, coax was fine, but the ground block itself was a a uh, a surge protecting ground block. Yeah. Huh. If, if you look at it, it, it'll give you the appearance that it's it's totally shielded, right? But the problem was the, the rear. Uh, housing cover, most of it was cast. I used to have it on my desk here, and I was just looking to see if I still had it. I don't see it. I must have packaged it away. But anyway, it's just a little, a little cube, uh, and and the the back cover to the casting was actually secured with glue, and uh, that something must. Have, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it, it just wasn't making connection at all. It was totally open. That reminds me of some of the old. Uh drop splitters that the industry used back, way, way, way back where there, there was a thin sheet metal backing plate that was just glued onto the cast housing. And, and um, I remember cutting some of those apart with a hacksaw to show people that this is not a good way to, to um, secure a splitter. And that was before the industry started migrating to the soldered on backs or the, the compression, compression um, pressed, uh, pressed in backs and, and whatnot, because the glue um, during the manufacturing process would seep right underneath the uh, the little piece of metal, uh, sheet metal backing, and, and it was an instant. Splitter designs had uh, pretty poor shielding performance, so it sounds like kind of the same thing on this surge protector or surge suppressor ground block. Yeah, I agree. That. That's, that's essentially what it is, yes. Yeah, and there was just recently a question on the SCTE list about you know what are what are good connectors, what are what are bad connectors, what's the field experience? I was I was surprised that definitely by far, the twist on connectors and crimp on connectors were really bad. But I mean, I, I have with me from the field, and uh, there we found a number of really high quality connectors that you know the the ones that you would expect to be good connectors that because of workmanship. Even a really, really good, you know, high quality snap and steel, steel, <laughs> yeah, a high quality connector. If the craftsmanship is not there and it's not installed properly because the F, uh, this the the pin on the connector is not pushed in right or it's not crimped right, they will leak just as much as a twist on connector or a crimp on connector. So I think part of that equation of understanding what's a good connector and what's a bad connector is also the craftsmanship 
and the skill. Someone has to really know how to how to put the connector on correctly. Otherwise, you know, a number of the connectors that we found that were bad were they were quality connectors. They just were they were pulling right off the coax cable because they were not compression fitted on or they, they weren't cut on correctly. They they were not installed correctly. I've seen that so many times where where the the connector um, installation is it's just not done right. Uh, either the cable's not prepared right, the uh, the connectors. Um, crimped on with a worn out crimper or, or not at all and there, I've seen instances where some of the the uh, the, the really high-end compression F connectors which otherwise are, are excellent connectors the the tech or who whoever was there just didn't bother to crimp it and you could pull the thing right off or, or the wrong connectors used on the on the cable and all of those things you know boil boil down to good old craftsmanship and that's still still kind of a weak link in uh, in that that whole mechanical installation it's got to be done right in order for the for the performance to be the way it's supposed to be yeah you mentioned a couple of times that, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry go ahead dick uh, brady mentioned a couple of times that, uh, that we had to get inside the house in a couple of instances well it was only a couple of instances the majority of what we found we didn't have to go in the house at all uh, we were able to clean things up with just uh doing a, a walk around finding the drop if, if it was underground locate it and do a walk around the house with that pressure test and engage uh, there's not an issue finding leakage within the house just by walking around the house and so in a lot of cases we just walked around and saw nothing other than what we found on the outside and sure enough um, uh, replacing the majority of the time replacing the connector uh, so what, about, what about just unterminated cables in the house or bad bad impedance on CPE, like TV sets, VCRs, whatever, you know, did you locate those and terminate it and keep troubleshooting or you just chalk it up to it is what it is kind of like uh, it's connected to the TV set and it is what it is. So that was one of the things that I was most surprised about John is that uh, first of all, an unterminated connector, if the connector is good, doesn't leak anything and, and doesn't let ingress come in. Um, it's only connectors that are not properly crimped or that are loose on the coax connector that, that cause leakage, both you know ingress and egress. Those are the noisy connectors. So like if, if this, uh, if you know, I'm holding up an F connector here, if the, if the F connector is properly terminated, you're, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna leak any noise. I was very, very shocked by that. And consistently we saw that. And so to your point, unterminated connectors in the home, um, I think are, are typically not going to be problematic provided that the connector is is well connected. So we we very fewly, very seldomly ran into that, as Dick mentioned. That uh, brings up my follow-up, is there are cases where you won't find any leakage on terminated drops, but definitely create reflections, mm -hmm. standing waves, impedance mismatch. So I would assume that you would pressure test the house and then you still have the problem, you move on to another way of troubleshooting that problem. Right, and right. and so the, the, the follow up is where we did run into problems in subscribers' homes was where the modem was not off of a two-way splitter. So, so ideally, if, if the modem was off of a two-way splitter, one leg of the modem is off of a two-way splitter, the rest of the house is fed off of the other leg of the two-way splitter, we didn't normally run into, into issues. If the modem was fed off of like a four-way splitter or an eight-way splitter, so now you have a bunch of cables coming off of that four-way or eight-way splitter going into the house, that seemed to always cause a problem that you did not have the same amount of isolation off of a four-way or eight-way splitter for the cable modem um, as you did with a two-way splitter. And I would almost ask Ron, maybe if you had insight into that, or, or John, as, as to why you get so much better isolation off of a two-way than you do off a of four or eight-way, because then now when you have like four or eight or six or whatever cables going into the home, that almost always caused problems for the modem. That's interesting. You ran across that um, a, a regular two-way splitter, assuming one of decent quality. Um, if if you um, 
put the thing on a test bench and do some some uh, isolation measurements on it. The, the isolation measurement result you get will be um, dependent upon the impedance seen at the input port. Uh, that's that's the way splitter design operates. When you get into four-way and eight-way splitters, those are those are made of combinations of two-way splitters. And the uh, the eyes the port port isolation is going to be a little bit more complicated because of the cascaded splitters inside the uh, the circuitry compared to just a standalone two-way splitter. So the the uh, port to port isolation on a four-way or an eight-way splitter can well can can vary a fair amount. Uh, the two-way is, is going to be pretty fixed. And dependent largely on that impedance at the input port, and it it may well be too that you also were seeing seeing situations where that two way or, or that four way or eight way splitter um, just had different values of impedance um, at the at the input. Now people say, well, wait a minute, the cable network is the seventy five ohm um, impedance network, but that's an ideal world, and we we like to describe it as a nominal impedance. And there are all kinds of things that come into play: the the cable, the quality of the cable. Um, bad splices, uh, the return loss on the tap out in the out of the pole or the pedestal, and um, you know, if the splitters after a, um, a ground block or something, what's going on at the ground block? So there are any number of things that can degrade the the impedance, with specifically what's known as the complex impedance, as seen at the input port to that device. So uh, what you may have seen may have been related to uh, other other potential faults in the drop or you know, just coincidence. Yeah, my my thoughts on it were is that when we moved a two-way splitter when we put a two-way splitter in and now the modem's off one leg of the two-way splitter and the other leg now is going into that existing four-way or eight-way splitter we're getting additional isolation now first right. it's the isolation from the two-way splitter and now the whatever additional isolation you know 20 db or maybe less than 20 db from the um four-way or eight-way splitter so so it's doubling maybe the isolation that we had my own uh, my own drop is like that, but it's uh, it's one of those uh, active splitters, and the uh, the input goes to a uh, a passive two way splitter that feeds the modem, and then that's the the second output of the of that passive two way splitter feeds an active, well an amplifier that that has enough gain to offset the loss of the I think it's a, an internal four way splitter so that it's effectively a unity gain. And you're right, that's got um, that's got better isolation and better overall performance. Looks like right. about the nice connect the upstream. Uh, I don't remember if mine is active upstream or passive upstream. I, I, I okay. can't remember anything in a couple of years ago. Isolation amp, so you have a downstream amplifier blocking the upstream from feeding back in. Yeah, from that. yeah, that, that's and that's a good point too. Is is uh, is that? But um, it does. Uh, I know that the, that the active part does pass two way because this it, that's how the set top communicates with the cable company's head end equipment. Yeah. So that was the. Uh, those are the big takeaways, and and to your point, uh, John, and as Dick mentioned, we didn't have to go into many homes, but the homes we did seemed to be ones with um, that weren't off a two-way splitter. So that was a big recommendation that we have: is always make sure the modem's off a two-way splitter, and that seemed to give enough isolation for the rest of the in-home wiring. When back in the day, we used to recommend directional couplers if we could, right? But then we start running into power level issues. Yeah, you don't. You know, you might, coupler, you don't get enough power then at the set top box if you're if you're running right. that. Of course, it depends on which which output port it's connected to which device. But uh, I agree. I like the idea of a of a two way splitter, and in the case of the these active splitters, if the if the power supply goes out or the amplifier fails or something on the on the active splitter part, that doesn't it won't affect the service to the modem because that's fed from a, a passive two way splitter circuit. Yep, absolutely. So any other thoughts on um, how you would address in-home problems with existing test equipment from you know, so something maybe different from pressurized test equipment? How can we, how can we reduce the troubleshooting time? Because I think that's well, the main goal. I think there are a number of ways to do it, and, and the cable industry is, has, has had a number of tools available for a long time. Certainly, those operators that have deployed a, a PNM tool or proactive network maintenance tool have I think an advantage in being able to get kind of a birth certificate for for a given installation. But um, something that a number of operators have done over the years is is um, take their handheld field instruments uh, that support an ingress test mode. And, and basically, what the what the tech or the installer does is go out to the pole or the pedestal, disconnect, make sure the drops disconnected from the tap, and connect that to the uh, field instrument so that the that the uh, 
the, the drop itself is connected to that field instrument and the uh, the instrument has the ability to display a, a range of frequencies typically in the return path it's you know, usually five to five to 42 sometimes it goes five megahertz to a, a higher frequency but it allows the technician to see if there's any ingress from say local FM radio stations or something coming out of the home through the drop and that could also be an indication of, of, a, of a potential shielding defect or defects in the home so that's that's another way that um, the techs can take advantage of their test equipment and if they marry that with with uh, a PNM tool and the ability to pressure test um, the drop by injecting a high level test signal is kind of the best of all worlds and and they get some they get the ability to identify potential problems that may exist at the time of a reconnect or even a new install um, get those problems fixed and and then uh, see what the PNM tool shows and and assuming everything looks good, store that as a birth certificate for that drop. And should something happen in the future, um, that information, if it's kept in a historical archive at the cable company tied to that customer's account, can then be referenced and say, oh, this is what it was when the the service, the last time the service tech was there, when the when the drop was first hooked up, and, and use that as a reference against which to compare uh, potential degradation down the road. John, would you what would you see on the flap list that would potentially correlate to things like loose connectors or intermittent connections on a on a subscriber's cable modem? And one of the flap lists would look at upstream station maintenance. So normally, you know, it's reporting upstream issues. Uh, one of the big ones is power level issues. So on the flap list, you would see uh, power insertions. Uh, you could track the modems with exclamation point on the receive level, indicating they're maxed out in power. You can track misses in the flap list, misses versus hit. That's basically the modem is getting T3 timeouts. And then if the modem in the flap list shows insertions, basically it's going online, offline. So that modem might be getting T4 timeouts. So we can look at the flap list and kind of get a correlation of the modem's T3 and T4 timers instead of talking to the modem itself. But I mean, we always say the more information you have, the better visibility you have into that uh, plant. So we talk about PNM being proactive network maintenance and being upstream related and pre-equalization, but PNM is more than that now, right? PNM is full bandwidth capture on the downstream. It's uh, add the Noxus 3.1 stuff in there. It's the upstream pre-equalization. We look at the CMTS spectrum analyzer. We look at the CMTS flap list. We look at correctable, uncorrectable effect. So we look at all this stuff together and we try to make an idea or get an idea of what the problem might be. I feel like all the devices in the field now give us visibility to target where we need to troubleshoot. Like you guys talked about, you identified 50 places to go look at instead of just wasting your time and saying, let's just uh, pick this house. You know, you just didn't haphazardly pick a house. You narrowed down 50 houses that you knew were maybe the worst offenders. You bubble the worst ones to the top of the list. You send out the technicians, they start here. We used to do that with the flat list. We used to clear the flap list every day and let it bubble up for 24 hours. Say, all right, who's the most active on the flap list? Let's send out the technician to fix those problems or find out what's going on. But the flap list is kind of limited, right? It's just looking at upstream issues. Um, what I'm finding now with the flap list, if I have a lot of misses compared to hits, it could be time offset related. So it has nothing to do with ingress, it has nothing to do with the plant. It's actually cable modems start drifting their time offsets. So that was one of the issues I start seeing in a plant that has nothing to do with the plant. It's not even really a sort of physical layer, but <laughs> it's not. It's the cable modem, the CPE are not really being um, compliant with the spec. Yeah. You know, the, the cable modem CMTS negotiate timing. And if that timing starts drifting for some reason, it's not like I moved the modem. You know, even if I did move the modem, it's not going to make my time offsets drift by thousands of ticks which indicate maybe a hundred feet away or maybe a thousand feet away or another 500 feet, you know, whatever. Um, so there are things I look at on the CMTS to kind of give me an idea of plant problems. Like if I have a lot of uncorrectable effect compared to correctable effect, I usually uh, indicate uh, impulse noise. So then, you know, I look up a spectrum analyzer trace. I query the CMTS for its built spectrum analyzer. I, I query path track. Uh, to see an actual spectrum analysis, uh, something that can trigger fast enough to pick up impulse noise. You know, the stuff that comes into CMTS usually isn't fast enough to trigger impulse noise or do zero span mode. So you might still need, you know, actual spectrum analysis capability that's meant to do that. 
You know, and, and to add on to what you just said, John, um, about spectrum analysis type capability, uh, DOCSIS 3.0 and later modems have um, this feature that you, you also mentioned called full band capture. And the, the silicon inside the cable modem can capture, um, depending on the, the, the version, can capture the entire downstream. Some can even, can even get into the upstream. But um, a lot of cable companies are using this full band capture feature in their cable modems to basically give the equivalent of a spectrum analyzer in every home that's, that has a, a 3.0 or later modem. And uh, the techs love this because it's a it's a really powerful tool that's even for a lot of techs easier to understand than trying to sort out adaptive pre-equalizer coefficients and and things that uh, that P and M has provided in the return path for the past several years. But now they can use this kind of addition to um, P and M um, and look for things like ripple across the spectrum or suckouts or peaking or or uh, um, what some people, some operators call adjacency, which is basically where the narrow cast injection levels don't match the, the broadcast uh, RF levels. And, and uh, you see roll off and, and excessive tilt and all these things in the field. And if they, if they um, hold several modems in say the same neighborhood that have this full band capture capability, it's possible to see, that, oh gosh, there's the, every, every one of these modems on this street has got ripple and it's the same ripple which can suggest that this isn't a drop problem or these aren't drop problems, but this is actually something in the, in the hardline feeder plant that is common to all of these homes that are displaying this problem. So here's yet another uh, indication that can be can be garnered from uh, from a PNM tool. And it may well be that the cause of, of that, let's say ripple as an example, could have a signal leakage component to it. And uh, that ties back into um, the, uh, the use of signal leakage test equipment or for keeping that plant nice and tight. And you know, in the old days, um, and when I say the old days, but going back to the 1970s, cable operators were monitoring for signal leakage primarily in one frequency, at one frequency, you know, upper end of the FM band or somewhere in the, the BHF aeronautical band. And, and the industry has done that for decades. And a tip of the hat to cable operators, they've really tightened up their networks in the aeronautical band. But when, when LTE started to be deployed back in 2010, the LTE operators were finding um, interference in the uplink. Um, I think Verizon was 680 or 7, no, 7, 80 megahertz, roughly, um, in the uplink. And it was determined to be leakage in the UHF band from cable networks. And of course, the techs didn't have any test equipment capable of making leakage detection measurements up there. Um, the uh, the field engineers from the, the LTE providers certainly did. They said, "Yeah, look at our look at our. You can see uh, this this leakage is coming from your plant, and yet the, the plant might be real tight at 130 megahertz." So, um, a tip of the hat to the test equipment manufacturers like Dix Company that have have developed um, test equipment now for leakage measurement that covers uh, multiple frequencies and, of course, is digital compatible. And this is allowing operators to to uh, look for leakage, not just at one frequency in the VHF aeronautical band, but at, at more than one frequency to really get an idea of what's going on um, with leakage that way, and particularly in the hardline plant where those uh, those uh, higher frequency leaks tend to be more prevalent. I mean, I, I think that when you started this uh, exercise, I we talked about narrowed down, uh, identifying locations. I would have took those frequency locations and then looked at their full bandwidth capture and see the devices that might add LTE or ingress on the downstream, because they're obviously probably the ones that are going to have leakage as well and, and have st signal getting in, right? So those would be the best ones for me to go with this test equipment to, you know, inject signal because I already know they're getting the signal in. Now, if I look at the map and they all show the same LTE ingress, then the common point might be the hardline cable, right? Not the actual house. Because if they're all off the same tap, then maybe it's actually before the tap because they're all showing the same. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this leads into the, the next um, example that I wanna show, but I'd like to ask Dick to just briefly explain what how the leakage equipment, this is different from the pressure testing, but the, the regular leakage equipment works because we also did a test that showed that there's really nice correlation between when you get an outside plant leak and when using the PNM tool, we see a correlation group. So could you explain that, Dick, how the leakage equipment is working? Well, yeah, it, um, at the head end, we'll insert a, a test signal as well. Um, 
It's the, it's the exact same signal. Well, no, it, it, the makeup is the same as the signal in the uh, pressure tester, uh, but we have to regulate the amplitude there so that it doesn't influence the uh, uh, QAM channels that it's parked between. In that instance, we actually put the test carrier in at 30 dB below the average power level of the adjacent QAM signals uh, to avoid interference and uh, inject it throughout the entire plant we can pick it up at places where it's uh, where, where the leakage is, is apparent. Um, loose connectors, uh, you know, loose connectors, I say that, and only after we started playing around with these signals at 612 megahertz did we realize that we weren't capturing everything in the world at 130 whatever megahertz and down in the FAA band. Uh, and it was, it became apparent that just a loose tap cover plate screw gave enough crap that it allowed uh, the signals to leak out. Uh, when the operator was complaining that he had more signal leaks than he can fix, we doubled that or maybe even tripled that by just moving the frequency from one, uh, 150 to, uh, to 600 megahertz. And I believe we're doing the same thing going from 600 megahertz to 700 megahertz. And Lord help us if we go to a whole gigahertz. In a thousand megahertz, will we uncover more? Ron? I suspect um, <laughs> it will be comparable to what's there now. Because I remember when, when this whole subject came up in 2010 and 2011, I went out and, on a number of uh, field tests with cable operators and, and some of the same test equipment that the LTE field engineers were using and and uh, the first time I went out I was just flabbergasted at the number of leaks in the UHF band. Um, typically it was really quiet down at 130 ish megahertz because the operators have done a, a good job of keeping the plant tight there but I was surprised at the number of leaks we we're seeing at the higher frequencies in the you know, 600, 700 plus megahertz range. Um, granted most of them were pretty low level but they were all over the place. Um, and that and they uh, they come from all the usual mechanisms we're used to, but it just happens that they they um, tend to be more efficient antennas, if you will, in the higher frequency ranges. And and to give you an example, and, and Dick, you mentioned a, a you know, loose screw on a tap faceplate. Uh, there's a, a type of antenna that many folks uh, in the cable industry may not be familiar with. It's it's called a, a slot antenna. And these are typically used in the UHF and microwave bands, um, but a uh, if you think about the dimensions of a half wave dipole at 750 megahertz, it's about you know, seven, seven and a half inches end to end. So that means a quarter wavelength is about half that. So call it three and a half inches, give or take. Um, now think about the dimensions of a of a square tap faceplate. It's you know three, four inches a side on a side, which says that right there you've got basically a quarter wavelength slot. Um, that is resonant in that six to seven hundred megahertz band or seven hundred to eight hundred megahertz band. And if the if the screws on the faceplate are loose or the gasket material has been damaged or um, you know, corroded or something else, the, uh, there, there's no leakage to be measured at one hundred and thirty megahertz because that's just not an effective antenna at that at the lower frequency. But oh boy, at seven hundred fifty megahertz, it's it's howling big time. Um, I've seen. Um, situations in the field where uh, the back nut on a, on a hard line connector could be loose by half a turn to a turn and a half. And that results in leakage at 700-ish megahertz. Absolutely nothing at 130 megahertz. And then, you know, radial cracks and squirrel chews and tr uh, tree rub, hard line cable, all the usual stuff. Um, this is where this, this RF gets out, but it tends to be more frequency specific in the higher ranges. Um, in particular because of the smaller dimensions of the aperture where the, the RF is getting out. And of course, I think it was mentioned, I think John mentioned, if you've got leakage um, happening in those frequency ranges, you've got ingress or, or vice versa. If you use full band capture to capture the downstream at a cable modem and you see LTE ingress, the odds are pretty good you've got UHF leakage around there someplace too. Yeah, that's true. And, and the, the interesting, uh, during those tests that we were talking about, we were in the field with uh, with the other piece. When we first test, started testing 612, uh, we were in a system that had uh, um, shrink, shrink tubing over the connectors. 
and, and the technician just grabbed one half of it with a one pair of pliers, half of it with another, and just gave it an eighth of a turn squeeze for it. And the leakage went from whatever we were reading to virtually nothing, just just from that, that one action. We saw the same thing here. Um, in fact, it's the, uh, the node that serves my neighborhood uh, because uh, I had gone out with another colleague with uh, a uh, piece of test equipment is the, the same that Rodian Schwartz equipment that the LTE guys use and uh, to try to replicate what they were seeing and and we found leakage right at the node and and one of the the uh, the, the techs from the local cable company just went up and and put a crescent wrench on the connector on the on the output of the node and uh, um, gave it a I don't know an eighth of a turn half a turn and the leakage disappeared. I suspect also that. Uh it's been a suspicion I haven't been able to prove it, but you know, in those cases where that tap plate cover screw is loose, nighttime temperature versus daytime temperature is certainly going to affect the frequency that that thing leaks best at. Somewhere along the line, it's going to it's going to catch us, uh, and uh, at whatever frequency we're operating it, and it will become extremely efficient. It's going to be interesting to see what happens as the as the cable industry starts migrating to higher and higher frequency operation above the, you know, the 870 megahertz or 750 megahertz or or uh, getting up to a gigahertz or even higher. What's that? What are we going to see at those higher frequencies leakage wise? Um, I don't know. Time will tell. I suspect we're going to probably see leakage up there, um, perhaps fairly widespread, uh, probably low level, but I don't know. Might be might be fun for some field tests and. Uh, preparation for a paper or something <laughs> yeah, not, un <laughs> unfortunately these leaks tend not to get better over time so so we end up um, uh, seeing something like this where the the leak becomes so bad you end up with a cluster of red modems and we call that a correlation group and the in-channel frequency response for a correlation group in the upstream looks something like what we're seeing on the screen here and we we do like these correlation groups because it gives us the ability to identify a group of modems on the same upstream channel that are seeing the same impairment. And then we, we can narrow in, we can separate uh, the, the blue modems in a correlation group from the gray modems that are not part of the correlation group. We can look at what's called the VTDR or virtual time domain reflectometer and we say, okay, that's an echo cavity of 144 meters that's telling us where the signals are bouncing back and forth in the system due to the plant impairment. We can then break out the plant maps and we can say, okay, uh, there's a, well, it's not 126 meters, it's uh, um, a, a little bit different. We're about three, th 13 meters off of what our, our, um, our taps, our digital taps are telling us in the pre-equalizer, but that's that's pretty close. That's getting us in. It looks like it's going under this road here or footbridge. Um, so we can say that, you know, from the visible portion, there's no damage evident to the hard line, but we're getting, uh, again, now we're using signal leakage gear that there's a strong signal coming from the duct crossing the street or going under the street. Um, so we can, we can hypothesize that the, the cable going under the footpath is damaged. It's not visible, but we're getting, again, that signal leakage coming there. So now we're using kind of the, the test equipment we've been talking about. PNM is showing us that there's a lot of um, cable that's been um, impaired. Um, the restoration, uh, basically what this is saying is that uh, people were going to wait for the, uh, the a, uh, maintenance window, but they went ahead over the weekend and they put in a new piece of cable and that resulted in identifying, um, if, if you zoom in here, some gnarly mashed up cable that was underneath that footbridge, or that was underneath the footpath. So you couldn't even see where the cable was damaged, but people were walking on it. And this, is, this was causing a whole bunch of cable modems to have their pre-equalizer working really hard. The cable modems weren't offline yet, but this is not the type of piece of cable that's going to get better over time especially after water continues to leak into it, corrosion starts to build up, eventually those cable modems would go offline. So you repair that, you look at the map again, and now we don't have this group of red modems. This was the before, a bunch of red modems down here, and the after. Most of the red modems are gone. The, the remaining red modems likely have in-home impairments that now we have to go fix those in-home impairments, but we got the big 
the big piece of damage first. So the neat thing about what you're just demonstrating here, Brady, is that, that the plant didn't have to be taken down to find the problem. Exactly. The PNM tool said, look, there's a problem out here. The leakage detection equipment said, yeah, it's right here. Leakage is verifying that <laughs> there's definitely yeah. a problem. Uh, that doesn't mean that every problem that shows up in PNM is going to be leakage related, but a lot of them are. Right. And, and, and it's also telling you what subscribers are impacted by it. Is, it. is it just one or two where maybe we should wait, you know, we can wait for a long period of time? Or is it in this case, you know, 30 or 40 subscribers are getting impacted. We may want to put this at a higher priority because it, it could be more catastrophic if and when, and likely it's going to be when, that piece of coax cable becomes so corroded it's going to take them offline. Yeah, I think the other interesting thing is, you know, the real life scenario of finding PNM that indicates a certain amount of footage or meters of distance in the cavity. But we all know as built and how people really <laughs> roll cable out could be off by 10, 20, 30 feet easily. You know, how you know underneath that ground, the guy didn't roll up 10 extra feet, right? Just because the map said 127, you knew that the PNM indicated 133, that's close enough. Because in reality, there could be a couple of zigzags here and there underground that you don't know about. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's there's inaccuracies with PNM and then there's inaccuracies with a map. And at least we're narrow like we're narrowing it down. We're not taking the plant down to to do actual VTDR or actual real TDR uh, runs to actually find that. So there's a lot of benefits there. And adding in the leakage equipment to also help validate what we're seeing is very beneficial. So there's a lot of changes that we see going on there. Um, so we got just a few more minutes left to wrap up. What are other thoughts do you guys have and maybe other different types of test equipment? Because I I know of at least one vendor that's starting to expose the pre-equalizer capabilities in their test equipment. Where we're planning on using that and starting to integrate that in. There's some other vendors that have new, they're basically taking cable modems and turning those into meters. I, I mean, there's a lot of evolution in test equipment that's coming on, that's just starting to uh, move out into the marketplace. Well, this is this is a fun time, I think, for those of us who are, are real geeks and, and love to play with test equipment. I, I've long been a fan of playing with spectrum analyzers and other other fun gadgets. And, and to be able to, to have the capability of spectrum analysis embedded in a cable modem is pretty powerful. Uh, the handheld field units that uh, the commercially manufactured test instruments and, and even the uh, cable modems that you mentioned, Brady, um, provide a lot of this functionality too. I've, uh, I've been playing around with some test, some, some demo test equipment at my house, keeping an eye on uh, the OFDM signal, um, as well as other, other downstream signals uh, here in, in the Denver market, because the local cable company has launched DOCSIS 3.1. And, and um, I think technicians can take advantage of, of the latest test equipment to characterize what the heck's going on because it really helps to provide a, a, a good picture of you know, not just signal levels, but breaking down the different types of signals into, into different measurement metrics and, and looking closely at the various things that can affect the signal. That, you know, is it bit error ratio? Is it modulation error ratio? Um, in channel flatness, all the other things that can be, can be gleaned from from today's test equipment. Uh, you know, the reality is techs aren't going to be given the luxury of packing a, a full tilt um, bench quality spectrum analyzer into the field, except perhaps on, on some real oddball cases. But the, the capability built in to uh, today's handheld test equipment is, is amazing. And it's, and it's just so far ahead of what, what it was even 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, couple that with the, uh, the leakage test equipment that's available now um, that, that offers even more more capability and the, and the ability to look across a wider frequency range because we all know, um, and certainly those that didn't know it before, but I think have a good understanding now that leakage is, is very frequency, can be very, very frequency specific. It's not uniform across frequency. Uh, so you take the take the things like PNM and, and full band capture and the, the features in the newest handheld instruments, the features in the newest leakage action test equipment. It, I think it gives the technicians a, a pretty, uh, pretty good collection of, of tools to be able to really uh, optimize the performance of the network. Thank you, Ron. John, what are your thoughts? I mean, to take it a step further, is this is for Dick. Is there anything Comsonics is looking at to make this an in-service test? 
so I don't have to disconnect? Is there any way to cross um, to induce? There's always a way to cross induce a signal onto the braid, the ground, right, Ron? I mean, it's like a reverse. It's like the cable clothespin. Remember that? Well, yeah. Yeah, you, you you basically couple it as a common mode current onto the outside surface of the drop cable, and if the the uh, if there's a, a shielding defect in the drop, this signal you couple to the outside is going to show up on the inside, and then then of course you need some way to to monitor uh, that maybe with the full band capture or or something else. So there there are a lot of different things that can be done to uh, to troubleshoot problems. I'm just I'm just trying to think out loud of you know how to be proactive. We don't want to take down the customer at all. And if we find that most of the issues were outside, um, why would I want to take the customer down if I, I could somehow end the problems without having the customer to lose service? And if I injected signals that were in between channels and it didn't actually interfere with the existing channels, then why not do that? Now I can think about injecting at a tap, the tap uh, 5 8 port, like inject with a, a probe, but that would, that would hit everybody at the same time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. How do I do this in service? Yeah, in, in services, <clears throat> it always it, it, it will get us to the point where uh, we're we're back to trying to inject the signal at the head end. Um, as we move ahead, which of course puts that signal level really low job, <clears throat> almost impossible to capture uh, at the levels that the drops are being injected into the home. You, you just really limit your dynamic range when you do that. But as we as we do move ahead and get uh, uh, into the OFDM area, uh, we have the ability to use the pilot carriers, the pilot tones, which gives us at least a 13 dB advantage over trying to bury that uh, that little marker signal between the two palms, because the pilots sit 6 dB above the average power level of the subcarriers, right? So they're already high and it's going to give us a heck of an advantage. So it's possible that the pressure tester um, might see a limited use so long as we're stuck with burying that signal 30 dB below the bomb. Uh, don't know. Don't don't know that for a fact. But the pilots will give us an advantage. I got uh, one more question. Brady, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but what if I have compact distortion or have you seen cases where CPD is evident, but it doesn't show anything up on p &L? So I think two things we see is typically if we have a case of common path distortion, we're, we're normally seeing a micro reflection someplace. So we're, you know, that micro reflection is normally showing up as a correlation group. When we fix the correlation group, the CPD goes away. We're seeing CPD when we're using our return path spectrum analyzer. Uh, if they have analog carriers, we're seeing CPD as six megahertz tones in reverse. And uh, if they don't have analog, we're seeing CPD as elevated noise floor. So we have our upstream monitor, which constantly pulls the return, and we can see that CPD uh, breathing or coming and going typically as CPD does, but we're also, we're normally having outside plant correlation groups. And if we focus and eliminate all the outside plant correlation groups, normally that also eliminates the CPD. It's like the composite carrier to ingress noise ratio composite. Yeah. I've yep. heard from uh, at least one cable operator who's doing uh, a lot with PNM that that um, they basically stopped looking for, for uh, CPD. Um, because they they found so many issues with the PNM that as they fixed those issues identified with PNM, they, the instances of CPD went down by yeah. a bunch. Eliminating, so that, eliminating correlation groups, eliminating micro reflections from your outside plant is yeah. a really great way to eliminate CPD. So that can be very helpful. That's a good point. <laughs> so, um, Dick, I liked what you said about uh, OFDM and being able to use those pilot tones to to uh, help identify impairments in the home. That would be very helpful, especially yeah. if you just had a meter that can lock onto those and pick up the intensity of them and walk around. That would be very good. That's that's getting more and more excited. I'm I'm really getting excited, guys. I'm having the time of my life uh, working in the cable industry. Ron, like I said, or like you said, uh, if you're a geek on test equipment, 
this is definitely the time. I think if you're a cable operator, you have more options at your hand at your hands than ever before to to work in the industry and take advantage of all the test equipment capabilities, whether they're software or hardware related, and play them, plug them all together and work with them. So gentlemen, I think we're at the top of the hour. Mr. Yeah. Downey, Mr. Rannick, Mr. Shint, thank you so much for your time today. This was an absolutely great episode. Well, Mr. Volpe, thanks for having us on. This has been a fun time, and and uh, I'd like to say um, happy holidays to everybody uh, on the group here, uh, in the group here, and also to those who have tuned into the uh, um, the Google Hangout today. Yes. I'm here with Merry Christmas to everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas to everyone. So we do our best to bring our audience great technical content every month. You can watch us live on air, catch our episodes on volpfirm.com or audio-only version via podcast. If you've enjoyed this webcast, please do hit the subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you next month when we discuss Remote 5, our fire Remote 5, doesn't matter how you say it. The hype is real with special guests. So catch you next month. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas all. Bye-bye. We'll see you. Bye. Bye.